We're back here at the Tulsa Arms Show. Jim Sapika is with me again for some special fun curators corners. Jim, there's so much stuff here, and, 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 and our friend here from Burlington, Kansas, John, great name by the way, brought in some really neat revolvers, and, and, and tell us a little bit about them. What are you looking at here, Jim? Well, he, he brought in this neat little revolver here, and I had to borrow these two from my, my friend Dan Cole with Old Town Station Auction to tell this story, because this auction, or this, uh, this little gun has a, a special place in uh, firearms evolution. I love when guns tell stories. This is a cool one. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a Moore's front-loading revolver. And uh, uh, to give you an idea of what it is, it was made from about 1864 to about 1870, so started production about at the end of the Civil War. And uh, about uh, 30,000 of them were made. And we're going to uh, see if I can remember how to disassemble this little puppy. Oh, but it. it is a front-loading <laughs> revolver, so the barrel removes and you load it from the front wow. of the cylinder. Now, the interesting thing about this gun, you see the standard cylinder in the front where the cartridges load in. Yes. Look at the diameter of those holes. Now we're gonna look at the back of the cylinder. Oh, wow. And those are just little tiny holes in the rear of the cylinder. So how in the world did you load the, how, how did these cartridges work and why is the question. Well, that has to do with the story of firearms ignition evolution. And of course, Samuel Colt introduced the effective percussion revolver, a huge, huge advance in repeating firearms. And this is a, a Colt 51 Navy, uh, nice ivory grips on it, but worked like all of the Colt percussion revolvers and the other percussion revolvers at the time. When you wanted to load this gun, you would uh, uh, place, or you would pour a charge of powder in each chamber. You'd place a lead ball in the chamber, and you would ram it home with your ramrod like that. And then you would put a percussion cap on each of the six nipples on the rear of the cylinder. And then you'd be ready to go. You'd have six shots. Right. And then when you had to reload, it was kind of a pain. Plus, you're fumbling with uh, uh, either pa fragile paper cartridges or loose black powder, powder and those little yeah. bitty percussion caps. A good gun for five or six shots, but when you had to reload, it, it was a problem. Yeah, forget about it. Well, uh, uh, Dan Wesson came up with a solution to that, and that was the self-contained metallic cartridge, just like we know today. Big innovation. He came up with a cartridge that is identical to the 22 short that we know today, and he introduced a little revolver to shoot it. He called it, it was the first model that Smith & Wesson had made, they called it their model number one. And uh, it's an odd-looking revolver by our standards, but it really is the, the beginning of the modern, uh, modern revolvers, modern repeating handguns. The barrel tips up to load and reload. This is a beautiful condition one. Cylinder comes out, and you reload it, uh, load it from the rear. Uh, interesting ejection, you pop out your empties like this mm. with that little stud mounted under the barrel. But uh, a tremendous advance right. over the, uh, the Colt revolver. Now there was one catch that allowed Smith & Wesson to make this. Dan Wesson had come up with this design with this cylinder board through end to end. He went to patent it, and by golly, somebody already had a patent on a cylinder board through end to end. It was a guy named Rollin White, and he had taken this design to Colt, of all people, and uh, uh, he wasn't thinking of it as a cartridge. He was thinking of it as a way to improve the percussion revolver. Colt looked at it, he didn't see any use for it, said, no, we're not interested. But Roland White still owned the patent. Well, Smith & Wesson arranged to buy the patent from him, pay a royalty on each gun they produced, so they owned the patent on the cylinder board through end to end. This was a huge, obvious improvement oh, yeah. in technology. Smith & Wesson had the monopoly on it in terms of an effective cartridge revolvers. So some people just started stealing the idea and grinding out the revolvers anyway. And there was, there was a huge suit by Smith & Wesson that finally stopped everybody who was right. copying their revolvers. But other guys said, let's do a different ignition system that does not rely on the board through cylinder. And that's what Moore's did. He developed a new cartridge. And what it was, it's, it's a, a metallic cartridge. But instead of having the rim at the backside, it tapers to a point and then a little teat comes out that contains the priming compound, right. and the little teat sticks through those holes in the back. So the hammer comes down, instead of hitting the rim of the uh, cartridge as it would on the Smith, right. it hits that teat to ignite it. So it was a totally different cartridge. Uh, it didn't infringe on the patent, and uh, actually, 
for that period uh, before 1870, when the Rollin White patent expired, Moore was one of the more successful small competitors of Smith & Wesson for the uh, repeating cartridge revolver. So uh, it's a cool little thing. Uh, it just shows what a vibrant industry uh, the firearms industry was in America. Yeah. The level of innovation. innovation exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. On, entrepreneurial yeah. uh, spirit. Yeah. And uh, he made a good little gun with a little system. Became obsolete, but uh, he had a nice chunk of the market for a little while. So, John, how, how long have you had that firearm? Uh, about six or seven years. It uh, came from my wife's great uncle's collection. He was a lawyer up in Kansas and uh, a lot of times when people didn't have money they would uh, hey, compensate well, him with a firearm. Yeah. So he had quite yeah. the collection. Well, another interesting yeah. story to tell about yeah. that particular yeah, firearm. It is. It's a nice little gun. A lot of these did have the engraving. You can see the engraving still uh, on there, but a lot of the Moors you do find with with engraving, which was a, a special order feature on most other firearms. A lot of the silver plate still there on the gun, so it's in very nice condition. Sure it's is. in uh, NRA antique, uh, very good to find condition. I think that little revolver is probably a uh, uh, five to eight hundred dollar gun. Nice little piece of firearms history. Uh, cool little gun. Thank you for bringing it in. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. For being here again in Tulsa for Curator's Corner.